I'm still out of breath. <laughs> and just in case you ever forget that we're streaming, we won't. The reason that I'm squinting is because there are these nice lights here so that they're not getting shadows. So I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> um, so to, uh, to um, give you what the Southwest Airlines uh, flight attendants do, if you are here for I Laugh, Therefore I Am Part 2, you're in the right place. If you're not, you can get up and go to the right place now. I hope nobody does, but okay, good. You're all in the right place. So I want to call your attention really quickly to, I've written our email addresses up here, Kelly Hover and Ann McQueen. Um, I don't know that we have enough handouts for everybody. I, um, I only made 60 because I was pessimistic, I guess, but, um, but we're so happy that there are more than 60 people here and so happy that you guys are here. So um, please feel free to email me and let me know if you'd like the handouts. Um, they're a little bit different than what was on the web because those were due kind of early and like many geniuses, we wait till the last minute to do our final edits. <laughs> so um, what you're getting right now, what Karen is passing out to you is a little bit different than what's online. Um, the online stuff is basically the PowerPoint and this is some exercises that um, we'll have you do along with some other information. So I'd love to send it to you. Just send me an email and say, I want your Pioneer Network stuff and I'll just send it all to you. So, um, for the first part, we asked, who are you and why did you get up so early in the morning? Because that was at 8 o'clock. Now it's a little later, and it's the time when most people would probably be getting up. Um, so we'll ask you instead, who are you and how did you get to be so charming and attractive? So how many of you are social workers? How many of you are nurses? Excellent. How many of you are direct care workers of some kind? Excellent. How many of you are in the activities or life enrichment profession? Excellent. How many of you are doctors? Now that includes PhDs as well. Okay, those are the real doctors, I think. <laughs> um, how many of you are administrators? Good. Like I said the last time, you guys have to have a good sense of humor. Um, how many of you are dietary, nutrition, excellent. Good, we'll have some juicy stuff for you later. Um, and how many of you are surveyors? Great, we had some surveyors in the last um, session as well, and it's wonderful to have surveyors here, I think that's great. Now, who did I leave out? Ombudsman. Oh, yes, how many of you are ombudsmen? That's great. Now, how many of you are volunteer ombudsmen? Because I know in some states there are volunteers who do ombudsman work and some who are not. So, But it's great to have ombudsman here. Now, I have to, um, I, this gentleman who I don't know came up to me and he said, how do I get a whoopee cushion for my 10 grandkids to take home? So I need to see your name. Ralph. From St. Edward, Nebraska? I was born in Lincoln. It was. So Ralph said, how do I get a whoopee cushion from my grandkids? And he said, I have a Methodist joke. And I said, okay, I'll give you the whoopee cushion in advance and then you can tell the joke. So we're going to turn it over to Ralph for a moment. To earn his whoopee cushion. Okay, I am a Methodist to start out this. <laughs> how many Methodists does it take to change a light bulb? Change? He says, change? Oh, come on, give Ralph some props. Yeah, how many of you are willing to get the microphone and tell a joke first thing during the presentation? <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. So today, what we're, what we're going to do is part two of our presentation. But before we, oh, who are we? Um, so how many of you were in the last session, part one, that we did? And how many of you are new to this session? And how many of you really care at all about us or you just want to get onto the talk? <laughs> okay, we're gonna just get onto the talk because <laughs> they're like two people who care. Um, I'm Anne, that's Kelly. We're both highly professional, very well respected in our fields. That's all you need to know. <laughs> 
So this is our agenda for today. We're going to do a brief review of part one so that nobody feels like they came in um, unprepared. Then we're going to talk, um, Kelly's going to talk about designing humor programs for laughter rich environments. And she's going to, um, then I'm going to talk about comparing positive and negative humor and the potential impacts on mental health of elders and congregate settings. That sounds really scientific, but basically, um, for my doctoral dissertation, I did a lot of interviews of people and um, looked at how humor related social interactions affected their depression and, and other emotional feelings. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to give you a chance to um, create a little plan for what you want to do when you go back to your work settings, whatever those may be. I know for me, a lot of times I come to a conference like this and I get all energized and I'm dancing around to music and I love it. And then I get back and, you know, work throws stuff at you and you're kind of back to the norm and you sort of forget all of the energy and all the stuff that you were thinking of when you were at the conference. So I want to give you a chance to actually write some stuff down, have it be able to refer back to it, to give you that little pinch in the rear that you will need to uh, keep up with what you planned. So first of all, um, let's talk a little bit about what happened in part one. Rump roast, how many gave it a five? Four, three, two, one. Uh, this was the hot dog vendor. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. I have to talk to you, honey. <laughs> No, I, no, no, it's not a bad thing. I just wondered what, what made you give that a one? Uh, because the people who didn't know what was going on honestly thought the man's hand was burning off. And I don't think that's funny. So you felt like it was cruel. Yeah. yeah. I just have trouble with the idea of burning flesh myself, but, you know. But I, that's good. There are no wrong answers. Whatever you pick is fine. It's, it's your life. It's your choice. But I'm, I'm always interested to know. Um, how about this bear, which technically is number seven, but it's called number eight. How many gave it a five? Four, three, two, one. Okay. Why did you give the bear a one? I just, to me, it's like stupid humor. Okay. No, that's totally fine. And you know, a bear on his back. You feel bad for the bear. <laughs> How many people gave this a five? Alcoholics. <laughs> Four. Sort of alcoholics. Three. <laughs> Do you, now, let me ask, those of you who gave it a three, a two, or a one, how many of you, of those who gave it a three, two, or one, are avid wine drinkers? How many are non-drinkers at all who gave it a three, two, one? Okay, just, just a poll, it's just, you know. Uh, chicken, choke the chicken. How many gave this semi-humorous cartoon a five? <laughs> Four, three, two, one. How many of you are chicken farmers? <laughs> hey, there is a growing movement of people who have chickens, you know. Now, what did you give it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how many of you thought the choke, the chicken? No, I'm being. <laughs> <laughs> As long as you're stuck in the funny place, that's okay. And then how many of you um, thought Carol Burnett was a five? Thank God, because if you guys dissed on Carol Burnett, we'd have to have a long talk and the session would be, you know. Four, three, now you guys are like, oh, okay. Two, one. All right, those of you with threes, I'll let you pass, but <laughs> no, really. It's, I think that 
why I do this is because I think we all have a concept of what a sense of humor is, right? I mean, you all came here because there's something about humor that appeals to you, right? But humor is vastly different from one person to the next. And people's senses of humor are vastly different from one person to the next. There was probably almost nobody in here who had exactly the same answers for all of those different stimuli that I showed you, right? And there were some people who thought that polar bear was a five and some people who thought it was a one. And so you have this concept of sense of humor, which is something that makes sense to people and you kind of have an idea of what it is, but when you really start to study it, it's completely variable. Now this conference is about person-centered care and part of using humor effectively is doing person-centered humor. And that takes what? What's sort of the pillar of, of, of what you have to do in order to provide person-centered care? What's the one thing you need to do? <laughs> know the person, exactly. So I wanna ask you this. How many of you feel like you're doing person-centered care in your communities who work in a community? Now, how many of you who raised your hand have something about the person's sense of humor on the person's service plan? How many don't? Well, there's one thing you can write down to do when you go back. I challenge you to put something about the person's sense of humor, a phrase that makes them laugh, a type of humor they like, something like that into your service plan. Because if you are really practicing person-centered care, I mean, how many of you feel like your sense of humor is sort of an integral part of who you are? Wouldn't you want somebody to have that in your service plan if you were living in a community? Yeah? So I challenge you to do that, try to incorporate that. Um, so there are lots of different sort of pieces to person-centered humor. You need to have the right stimulus. Um, as we just um, saw, some of those stimuli did not make you laugh. They did, you didn't think they were very funny. What's interesting about this group is sometimes I'll have groups where I do this and people laugh hysterically, but then they're rating everything threes and fours. This group was very quiet, but you had a lot of fives. So you're a, I don't want to say silent, but deadly group. That's not what I mean. <laughs> but your, your, your laughter is more, um, it, it's quieter, but it doesn't mean that you don't think things are funny. I think that's also something that's interesting to consider, is just because you don't hear somebody roaring with laughter doesn't mean that they're not enjoying something or that they're getting something out of it. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so you have to do it at the right time. Um, if we were um, not in a session about humor, if we'd been talking about you know, survey deficiencies and um, you know, how to document them best, that might not be the right time. Of course, then again, it might really be the right time. So timing has everything to do with whether humor is successful or not. Uh, it needs to happen in the right place, with the right person, and most important, the right relationship. So how many of you can think of somebody um, you know somewhat well who you wouldn't really dare joke around with? Can you think of somebody like that? So you have to kind of think about why is that. Sometimes it's good that you have those relationships. Sometimes you forge more connections and then you get to a place where you can you know, start to use some humor with that person. So it's important to recognize that just saying, I'm gonna play I Love Lucy for people on the television is not a humor program. You have to personalize it, individualize it, put it in a service plan, um, think about that individual human being and we'll talk a little bit more about how you can do that a little bit later on. Um, actually, how about right now? So if you look in your packet, how many of you have a packet um, that was passed out today? How many don't? Okay, so those of you who don't, um, take down my email address and I'll mail this to you. Um, I'm not gonna have you do this exercise the, the way it was written, but in the packet is a sense of humor profile. Um, it's a little thing that I created that I want you to feel free to use. There are no copyright infringements. But like I told the last group, if you start, if you put your name on it and start charging for it, I'm coming to get you. <laughs> so 
This basically just gives some questions that you can ask an elder, or you can ask an elder's family or friends, if the elder can't communicate it to you in a way that you can understand, about things that that elder enjoyed related to humor. Things like, you know, were there phrases or songs or television shows or jokes that that person always thought were funny that you can bring back into that person's life to kind of infuse a little bit of humor um, into their day. Um, so I want you to, th instead of doing this exercise, we'll kind of skip over that, but I want you to think about if you were an elder and you were living, you were moving into a community and you had one line on a service plan that someone could fill out to um, help them understand your sense of humor more, I want you to think about what that one line would be. You have to limit it to 10 words. So take about 30 seconds and think about what your one line would be and then I'll ask for a couple volunteers to tell us what that one line would be. For those of you streaming, you can do the exact same thing at home. <laughs> Does anyone want to share what their line would be? You've been voluntold. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, take my advice. Pull down your pants and slide on the ice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, take my advice. Pull down your pants and slide on the ice. Welcome to the Pioneer Network, everyone. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so would you want people to say that to you? Or would you want people to actually do it? Okay. Who else? Oh, good. This side of the room. I'll come to you, too. Phil Donahue. I enjoy political satire, dry, witty humor, things like Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert. Excellent. The Colbert rapport. Good. Now, uh, who had a hand up over here? There you go. Okay. I'm going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> I'm going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> Good. Anyone else want to share one? Yes. Oh, here, I'll get you first. Okay. Um, has a dry sense of humor, doesn't enjoy slapstick or violent humor, or violent humor as in when somebody <laughs> falls down and... No Pratt Falls. You didn't like that bear, did you? Okay. She did not like the bear. Someone asked me my motto in life, and I really didn't have one, so I jokingly was like, you gotta risk it to get the biscuit. Oh, I've heard that. I've heard it in a somewhat different context, but we'll, we can go into that later. <laughs> Anyone else? This is good. Mine is, it's not really humorous, but mine is, wake me up at 4 a.m. and feed me cookie dough and all will be well. <laughs> So there are four humor styles that I just want to um, make you aware of. Um, and if you send an email and ask me for my materials from part one, there's a humor styles questionnaire in there that you can take and kind of figure out what your um, tendency is in terms of styles. But um, there's affiliative humor, which is the kind of where I'm showing you the, the stimuli. It's not really about any person. It doesn't hurt anybody. It just gives us sort of a bond through laughter together. Um, it's pleasant. It's definitely a positive kind of humor. Um, Self-enhancing humor is something um, where maybe you make a little joke about yourself that makes other people feel comfortable um, or makes them laugh. And, you know, it enhances you a little bit, but it enhances the other person, and it's just a nice, pleasant kind of humor, good-natured. And then three and four are the, what they consider the negative styles of humor. Aggressive humor that makes fun of people. Um, you know, we, a lot of us like things like Saturday Night Live or, you know, Jon Stewart, Stephen Colbert. They make fun of people, um, and sometimes that can be, you know, quite funny but it can also be um, offensive to some people. Um, and then there's self-defeating humor. And like I told the last group, Chris Farley is sort of the poster child for this um, area of humor. It's humor that where you're making fun of yourself so much that it's really damaging to you and leaves the, the audience or the people you're, you're communicating with feeling sort of 
down at the same time that they're laughing. Um, I don't know how many of you remember Chris Farley, but he was always, he made himself the butt of the joke every time. And it was funny to some people, but not all people. And, you know, he ended up dying young. I think it was, it's a very self-destructive kind of humor. So now I'm going to turn over to Kelly, and she's going to talk about some of the programs, um, the humor-related programs that they did at Teresian House. And this all started, um, our administrator, Sister Pauline Reckoneer, who was uh, actually featured in one of the pictures in your program as um, she was one of the founders of the Pioneer Network, is not here today, but um, she had about a year ago, or two years ago now, had the idea of doing a humor project, getting more humor in the building and using the laughter and, and all of that. Um, and so she wanted one and she said, Kelly, do one. <laughs> so we, d we worked, we had a committee, we got together, and we came up with a plan just to kind of get it going. Um, and as I had said in the first one, we looked at some things on the internet, and you can always look at other programs that are out there. But what we decided was, after we got to this meeting, we had basically just three meetings with um, Sister Ann Bryan Smolin, who is um, a leader in, in, in humor and um, life in, in just coping with life. Um, and she has a lot of resources available to people as well. And uh, Father Malecki, who um, was a priest in our facility who was very um, inspired by Norman Cousins and really felt um, that humor was a great program. So we just kind of developed this program. We thought, oh, we're going to do a six weeks, immerse everybody in this all laughter-rich environment. Let's see where it goes. We had notebooks for people to write down experiences. And, and some of the aides did write that down. But as as you probably all know, you can have high visions of something going, you know, so wonderfully. And it really, at the end of the six weeks, did we have, like, re research study information? Did we have a lot? No. But we had a lot of focus on it, and we were able to come up with a ton of things that we have now available for families, for staff, for different programs, just to kind of get it going. I mean, there's just the whole side section of humor that's going to be spontaneous moments that are have nothing to do with humorous materials. They're just the day-to-day, -day, and that's personality-based. We can't teach a lot of your staff to do that, but we thought if we have other things available that kind of get people in that frame of mind, a little bit light, more lighthearted, maybe a little silly, we were going to be able to get it just more present in our environment. What we did at the beginning was we just put every humorous thing we could think of at, in our calendar. If we did this on our memory care unit, and we just plugged it in, and we just, oh, for six weeks, just tried to do everything we could think of. Um, the first thing we do, we just came up with some humor baskets. This was something we had seen on the internet. And we just put in there anything we could think of that would just sort of get people engaged. Um, as a speech pathologist, there's a lot of uh, focus in, in having something concrete, a shared item that is going to help the conversation and help pull more language and more reminiscence from the residents, um, that, especially that have cognitive impairment. But then you just have these goofy things, and it wasn't just the residents that got silly with them, it was often the staff. So you can see some of the things that we, we threw in there. I mean, the funnies, such an old, that was more their generation that really connected with the funnies. I remember my grandfather used to put, the, we used to put the silly putty on it and do the pictures. They would pick those up and just start talking to each other like, oh, ha, ha. and, and it, maybe the language was not actually coherent, but they were both, these two residents were engaging with the comics. Um, things that you squeezed that um, would laugh, we threw those in there, smiles on a stick, um, we ordered these riddles on a jar, and we didn't spend a lot of money on this. Much of it was inexpensive things we found, Dollar Trees, and at the back of the handout on the, in, on the website, it has the resources of all the different places we, we, we obtained these things. We had a little bit of grant money and we used some of that. So just goofy things, the, the wind-up chattery things they absolutely loved. So here's, <laughs> this was that they'd grab the wigs and just wear them around. Well. She may have even forgotten she had the wig on, but every staff that then passed her had an interaction with her about that wig, and she'd laugh, and you know, it just became, and then add the whole sensory piece, and there you've got all kinds of, um, of sense of uh, integrating different people's levels. I love the fact that, look what she's washing the glass with. It's the cordless phone from the unit, so nobody could get a hold of the unit because she was washing all the dishes with the cordless phone, but she was having a great time. This was one of our riddles in a jar, and boy, was it a riddle when we opened it up and someone's dentures were in there. <laughs> we never did find out whose they were, but um, yeah, that was it. <laughs> these are the wind-up toys. I mean, you just think that these are silly and childish, but you put them on the table and you let them race. 
oh my gosh, they think it is the funniest thing in the world. And the staff, see, you get the staff involved. It's like something goofy as that. They'll sit there for a half an hour playing with the wind-up toys while the residents are interacting with them. I have uh, Katie from Teresian House is here. It's her first Pioneer Conference. Hey, Katie. And we have some prizes. There are two little wind-up monkeys in there. Raise your hand if you want two little wind-up monkeys. Oh my gosh, everybody wants the monkeys, Katie. <laughs> I want, when you, when you pick somebody, okay, just pick, go. Well, we want you to tell us something that makes you laugh. Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Anybody that smiles at me and I can interact and tell a joke, whether it's dirty, funny, racist. <laughs> so she said anyone that, that looks and smiles at her and she'll interact in telling jokes. So, okay. Um, these are, you can get these all over the place, mostly the Dollar Tree is where I get them. Um, the chattering teeth are always a big kick for the residents because you know then you can... Oh, did you give out two different ones? They were supposed to get them together so they could race. No, it's okay, it's fine. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, what makes you laugh? That when residents say something really funny, and I do have a, a story of that. I was doing a modern art. I had gone to this, I had gone to, I think, Pioneer, was Meet Me at MoMA. They talked about how modern art was going to be such a, a, an open-ended experience that the residents with dementia would have no wrong answer. And so we put up all these pictures on the slideshow, we talked about them, and they'd see things that weren't there, which was fine. And we had a, and then we did a whole art project. So this one resident, pretty advanced, I mean, she pretty much most of the day reads the serial number off her walker. And um, so she came over to me and she said, my breast is not in my bra anymore. And I said, okay, and I had been an aide, and so I was very comfortable with assisting her. And I said, well, let's go over here. And I did the push it up and in and get it in. And she turned to me and she said, you know, you thought you were an artist, but you're really a sculptor. <laughs> I mean, that, that was one of the most priceless ones. <laughs> Um, here is one of our res he's a priest, oh, yes. then he just was a goof, and he would act so silly with these things that he got everybody else cracking up. So it's a tiny dollar store purchase, and it gets this whole environment going. Um, and unfortunately, as you know with memory care units and the dentures, all of these little pieces disappear over time, and we find them, so we have to kind of reassemble the humor baskets. We did this as a project, we need a smile box. Um, just put stuff in it, sensory things, funny things, same ideas as the, as the baskets, but this way it could be kind of more of like a guided activity. In there, I have a little starter kit for someone to make their own smile box, a couple little cutouts of smile faces. The residents had a ball doing this, finding the pictures in the magazines. And I use magazines for so many things, because they're free. And I can just put out an email and get tons of them donated. So we're gonna give out a little starter kit. Yep, with the folder. Who would like a little starter kit for your smile box at home? Hmm, I don't know. You got any more ideas? You're so good at that stuff. Make a face. Make a face. Good one. Make the happiest face you can make because you got that. All right. <laughs> we, to, to uh, take it on another level, I found what's in Ned's head on eBay. Some of you have probably seen this. It's a kid's toy. It's a game. And you reach in and you pull out like a Q-tip with earwax, earwax on it and like a baby diaper. It's actually marketed for um, autism a lot, for sensory. But they, they just, you put stuff in there and you've just changed the whole activity to being even sillier. Um, so they do enjoy that kind of a thing. And, and I got it used for like $10 on eBay. Um, here, we did do, we did a circus and I'll show you some pictures of that. But through that, we just got some goofy um, things. Does anyone want like jelly beans? Does anyone jelly beans? I have a, a whole can of jelly beans if anyone wants. You like jelly beans? Okay, here you go. Could you, could you give one to her next to you, though? Open it up. <laughs> oh, shoot! You just fell for it. <laughs> That's not a prize, by the way. <laughs> I will give you a prize since you did that, but you can't have that. <laughs> it has too much power to get everybody laughing. But we just have goofy things. And could use it with a clown, but we don't even need to. We just call it the gag bag. Um, all right, laughter size was when we had started to really put in... Um, 
we always want to get them moving. And the more we can get the, the uh, activity and physical activity, so we try to pull it into our laughter size. We do this right now once a month. I do it. I'm hoping that people will start to really do it on their own, because it doesn't need to be me to do it. But even something as goofy as a little set of pom-poms with the hip, hip, hooray, has led to all these, one time this resident took the pom-poms into her school cheer that she remembered, and then the resident next to her said, I went to that school too. And like it was, how would we have ever known that they went to the same school? But it's just the littlest thing. And um, it's so tactile too, when we put it in Ned's head and they pull it out and they're like, whoa, and they don't know what it is and you know, we kind of make a goof out of it. Um, but when I studied the laughter yoga, I watched a bunch of videos and at the first session I had said it was, it was not in me to go in front of people and to really replicate a laughter yoga program. But in it, they would just do something as the once one did, they just go, very good, very good, yay! And as silly as it looks, the residents love it because they can follow it, they're successful, and we might do it five or six times and then move on to something else, but we would put someone in the middle with the pom-poms and kind of have them guide everybody. So it's just the little things that lead to the activity so it doesn't even seem quite as forced or fake. This album we use, it's just all, instrumental music. So as you're doing the exercises, there's not a lot of competing noise and music with songs. Uh, you'll see a lot of my music um, that I found. My background is also in music, so I, I spend a lot of time with that. But I gave out handouts of all the songs that we've used. That's supplemental. Everyone should have one of those. Um, but this is really, you can get this on iTunes or you can order it on Amazon. It's um, just great. It's such happy music, and, and we use this all the time. Um, I found this parachute. I brought, I brought these things that you can also look at. This was, I mean, it, most of you, do you use parachutes? You know, they love them. But we had one, but I thought, well, gosh, this thing is so cute. And Amazon, or um, Oriental Trading had it for $10, and it came with six of these bean bags. So I thought, you can't even beat that price. And just the look of it adds so much to the activity. Um, we incorporate, you know, the whole, um, one of the domains of well-being, you know, to be education and learning and learning new things. So we do talk about, with the group, that the benefits of laughing, the physical benefits, and then we talk about the smile muscles, and then we exercise them, and we go around and have them all stretch them. And it's something they actually really enjoy, too. Usually, I'll put on a happy face, because it goes along with the theme. Um, these are the giggle balls. You squeeze them, and they, they, they make noise. Um, might toss them, might pass them around, have them squeeze them, good tactile hand. Um, we found these, and this is like, talk about cheap, they're just these cutouts from Oriental Trading, and we just glued them on tongue depressors, and we just hit the balloon around. We, ha we have the noodles that we use, and everyone loves the noodles, but so neat that when you do this, and we pat the balloon's going around, they have the paddle, and then they use the hand to hit the balloon. So just to be able to say, oh no, use your smile paddle, okay, coordination, change it, and then they, and it's a little more of a precise movement, so it just you know, adds a little aspect to it. These we've had, I, I tried them out first, where you know something may not always work, have them say good joke or bad joke. I had a happy face and a, uh, like a demon face on the back and it um, didn't work. It just didn't register whether good no joke, bad joke. So we transformed it into the paddles. This is, when we're doing laughter size, we'll have different people mimic different types of laughs. I use that big crayon just to point to them. They, they like that. It's like a Dollar Tree, big giant crayon. But I'll say, you know, make a, a laugh like a witch. And they, they just enjoy this so much. And once someone does it, the rest start laughing. It just is so contagious. Yes. Yes. Oh. Uh, okay. I believe I should be entertained as well. Okay. Walk you walk around. And actually, take the microphone so we can hear their replications of these laughs. Um, actually, what you can do is they, have to, they can pick the laugh. It's on these little cards. Okay. Which one you're going to have to Who wants to pick a laugh? Oh, good. Okay. Pick a laugh, Sandra. What have you got? Giggles. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Who else? You know, we're already over here. Somebody over here. We're gonna, okay. <laughs> What's your name? Ivan. Ivan's going to pick a laugh. <laughs> if you couldn't see Ivan's face, he went like this. <laughs> <laughs> went right back to deadpan. <laughs> Who's next? Someone where? Someone <laughs> where? 
<laughs> All right, Barbara. Ooh, witch laughter. <laughs> oh, good face. So, uh, Barbara is an independent nurse educator. Just what we want, some education like that from our, for our community. <laughs> Here's what I want you to do, wash your hands or else. <laughs> All right, who else? We gotta get one more. Let's go for the back here. If you don't volunteer, you might just get the microphone in front of your face. Oh, here's someone. Oh, good. Okay. Excuse me. Michelle. Oh, we had snorting already. Oh, we had giggles already. You have to do another. Sorry. She gets two pieces of chocolate. Oh, silent laughter. That doesn't count. <laughs> like how many times can we get you to do <laughs> all right last chance last chance oh good you looked like you were you know you were willing Kay so <laughs> yikes that was hysterical laughter give her as much chocolate as she wants <laughs> And okay. Can I see those for a minute? Because what I want to no, the, to, sh to point out now, one of the things we try to do whenever we're we're in, uh, especially on our memory care unit, but all of our unit our, our neighborhoods have people with dementia, is to try to enhance everything with something written. It's it's um, such a known aspect of dementia that they can read far longer into the process. Um, a lot of the Montessori work, um, Cameron Camp, and all these things we, we've studied and. So anytime, instead of just saying, do a witch giggle or do a witch laugh, which they may be able to do, but the more we add the written into it is why I lose a lot of these things because that then in turn gives them that much more success with comprehending. Um, and some of the residents who can't even do it can at least read it out loud. Uh, the staff still, I would have, it's been years since we did the work with a dementia, a Department of Health grant on all of you know, the preserved reading and ways to tap into that. And the staff still say to me, I couldn't believe it, she was able to read. I'm like, yes, that's what we're trying to say is that if you add the, give them the chance to read, they'll be able to be more engaged. Um, don't worry, be happy. Um, that's just, you know, that song that everybody loves. But we found these at the Dollar Tree. And again, you just add the silliness of a puppet. I mean, this was, these were a buck. And you can even make them out of felt. But we had a whole bunch of them. And then we'll, you know, help put your arm up, make them fly, you know, do different activities with the puppet. Um, that's always been a, that's a big hit. Even just the fact that they have to sit there and put it on their hand, we have them do it themselves, is, is yet another beneficial part of it. We had a daycare on site, it just closed, which was heartbreaking to us, but we did so much intergenerational. The kids are gonna make them laugh without us having to do anything. Um, we, like, we do a lot of Halloween events and we have a lot of costumes, so like an Alice in Wonderland tea party, the little girl down on the bottom dressed up, going around and passing them out. Just so much joy and fun. Then the residents putting on the hats and thinking that they're just, you know, performers on, on Broadway because they've got the hats on. Um, there's our parachute kit that we did other things that kind of then led to this one. And then these puppets. These were probably our more pricey purchase. I think they were 39 Just having them available, I mean, a puppet, generally a puppet is going to bring someone out of themselves to talk with it. Um, my husband said he had to use a puppet for his discovery center in an environmental place, and he was trying to get a person to smile, and the person says, Wah, and walks away. So he's got the puppet at him. So not everyone loves a puppet, but... <laughs> The residents start talking to each other with them. It's like, okay, this is safe. I can get out of myself and simplify my language and not have to contend with all the difficulty with, the, with the, um, their own language. Clowns on rounds, we did dabbled in this a little bit. Um, there's a, a book if you want to get more into the whole clown aspect of it. Um, the Joyful Journey of Nursing Home Clowns. This woman, I just kind of came across this. But our res, just, just, they didn't even have to do anything, just putting them in the costume, they were thrilled. But they love going around to each other and talking to them and trying to get them to laugh. So a lot of work to get them dressed up and go moving on, but it was well worth it. Um, our funny photo booth was such a hit. It was $10 at Walmart. You, bought, you got the backdrop and you got these like, you know, stick things. And they could do this for hours. Go up in front, we have all different props. Um, talk about getting goofy. I mean, and we're, we're, we're crying, we're laughing so hard at all the goofy things we're doing. 
Um, we incorporated, we, we do a lot of like the sorting activities, again, that kind of stems from the Montessori uh, learning that we had, but like we got, used those cutouts and well, let's sort them. It's a pretty simple task, but you, you know, talking about happy things, you've got them in front of you. We do these ticket sorting, so we added one that was a carnival where we have the residents put the uh, tickets in the envelope and it's just a, a good meaningful task, even, even if the event isn't really happening, we, we treat it as though it were. Um, and then they, they love coloring, so we just added goofy stuff into that program. Um, this is something we, when I said we do a lot with magazines, like we do, you know, inside versus outside and just laminate the, the pictures and just have them and put the word on the back. So it's something that stimulates the conversation and they've got different pictures and then the task of sorting them. We just set up the pockets like that so they sort them. Um, but we do it a lot with the cheerful versus not cheerful. So you can look at one and say, you know, well, little boy with a, a Superman costume on, you know, is he cheerful or not cheerful and why? And the next thing you know, you've got all kinds of discussion going on about the picture. And then again, the written words in there. Um, same idea, but we do it with books that we leave around on the unit. We have them, you know, animal based, we have them food based. Um, oops, I hit that. So these are just magazine pictures. We find them and then we write our own caption. The fact that they can sit and look at the book and interact with it at a much easier level, there's They've got the magazine photo books are here that they're selling. Um, same idea where it's just a more um, a successful reading opportunity and keep that preserved and all kinds of conversation comes out of these. I saw a resident, he was sitting eating his breakfast and I, you know, I, I probably made like 50 of these and sometimes I go, you know, I don't know, do they really get used? And I saw him, he was sitting there eating his breakfast and he's like stretching up, trying to get the book off the shelf, put it down and just started flipping through it. So I said, yes, they do use them. So. Um, fishing, as a speech pathologist, every speech pathologist has a fishing kit for like fishing for the sounds. So I couldn't resist adding that in there. But I just took from the Dollar Tree, we just had these, I've laminated these, and we just clipped to that. They're the riddles. This is um, happiness topics that I got on Amazon.com. So we just clip the topic so that they fish for it with a little fishing pole, pick it up, and then say, okay, read it to us. It's a little more interactive and makes it a little more interesting. The music is, as we all, there's a lot of sessions on music this time, which thrills me, and um, I think everybody here knows how powerful music can be. This CD is, um, I ordered it just to see, it's supposed to be engineered to program the brain for happiness. So we haven't really experimented with it much. We have one resident who just cries all the time, cries, cries, cries. So I put it on an iPod for her and said, let's see what happens. I mean, it's worth a try. Um, it's like more like new age kind of background music, but um, people who, you know, feed the comments say, I feel happier after I listen to it. I don't know. But we, we use more peppier stuff when we're doing an activity, but this could be something that might be useful. Those, these lollipop drums we've had for years, but they have such a good time with those and they're just so happy and colorful. Um, happy sing-along we created. We do a lot with sing-alongs, as I'm sure most of you do, and I, I can't um, say enough, too, like the, having the songbook in front of them, even if they can't read it or sing it, they're, they're connected to the whole activity, and they often are so much more successful with the words in front of them. So we pass those out, and these are the songs, and on your little handouts, that's all broken down, too. Um, I just did a happy song bingo. We bought these little chips, they're like $3 for 70 of them. And um, just the songs, they just use these as their bingo chips instead of regular bingo chips. And then the bingo boards just look like that. So then we'll say the song might be, I'm singing in the, um, roll out the, so then they, they can, we play the song or we can just do it verbally. I gave you that too, so you could just use that. If anybody wants the bingo boards, I can email them to you. It's just 12 different ones and you can bring them home, uh, get them and laminate. So email me if you want those. They're my, I made them. They're not like pr proprietary or anything, so you can have any of that. Um, this was something I saw. We don't have it. We didn't buy it, but they do have the sing-along DVD that you could purchase. Um, again, the reason would be like Amazon, check any of those companies. Um, we had a bunch of carnival games, so we put them all in a bin so that that could be something too to pull out and just more fun, kind of silly type activities. We get, I mean, just, these are just basic games. There's nothing humorous about these, but <laughs> their comments. I mean, it doesn't take much to get everybody laughing with just their natural, spontaneous comments. So this is a big hit. Um, folks love this one. They love these Shake Loose of Memories, if you've ever seen these. But they, like, these are like the top successful activities. This is a new one we just ordered, and this was a big hit too. They really liked this one. 
um, you know, mini golf. So instead of it just being the regular ball, we threw in the smiley face balls. We do like a little co golf course uh, frequently for like people to um, come down and use uh, throughout the day, like families to come down and use it. So we added that. Um, we did do a comedy club. So in that, the, we have so much at, right at our fingertips with YouTube for funny things. I mean, you could do an entire two hour comedy club with YouTube videos. Um, there's so many, so that we use those. Um, then we do jokes, we have the residents come up and tell jokes. We bought a bunch of these books and kind of pulled what was good for us. Not every, you know, sometimes you get, you order a book and you're like, eh, there's only a couple good things out of it. So we just pulled, picked and chose. And all these kids' joke books, used bookstores or like um, garage sales, I get tons of them there. Um, this is something I had created, this Rate the Joke. I gave it to you in the handout. We use this um, for an early diagnosed dementia group um, that I help out with a communication topic. So we tell the joke and then they look at the sheet and they decide, it's basically what Ann did, but it's able to be used as a kind of a written activity on direction following and something really cognitive for, the, for these earlier stage folks. And they like to say, now what number were we on again? And then you go back and, and it just helps them interact with it at a higher level. Um, faces are funny. I didn't put her in just because Anne had the, oh, you, they didn't see her. They didn't see Lucy on this one. No, I put Lucy in part one. That's right. What I did with this is a slideshow. So just who's the, the humorous, the, the faces of comedy? And then they'll look at them and say, you know, they often will know them. If not, then I start with the first name and I click it and say, Lucy, Lucille. And then often then they get the next one. If not, then I'll prompt that one up and then they can read it. Oh, Lucille Ball. We did, we did one about famous presidents, not related to this, and it was John F. Kennedy. And they said, I know him. He said, wasn't he some kind of a, what did you, oh shoot, now I can't remember what she said. It was the funniest thing. It was like, didn't he play baseball or something like that? And it was like, um, not quite. But <laughs> um, so we just do the slideshow. But then we also put it in a book so people can go around and show the page. And on the back there's trivia and just it gets them involved. And this is like a little, almost like a little more um, cognitively advanced for some of our, our higher levels. This cart we just put together uh, very recently so that we could just go up and down the halls with it. What we found with the program is, you know, I gave the activities coordinators all this stuff, but then if it's like, okay, on Tuesday, August 2nd, you're having, you know, happy song bingo. We wanted it to be more like just kind of there. So the cart now we can, people can take and just kind of go up and down the halls and have all different things to interact with. We have, um, the, everything's on it. The bees are in there. We have a, a little docking station so all the music is right there. The happy song, bingo. Um, there's this book, and I think they had that out front too, where you can buy it. The, these books that are the simplified reading. So we put that on there. Um, what else is on there? The jokes, all the different resources, what's in Ned's head, the parachute. Here's the other side of it. And we just put in the bean bags. So that's just, just stuff. You can just get that little interaction going real spontaneously and less structured than the activity being um, the kind of thing everyone has to go round up all the residents. It just happens much more naturally. So we're really, really happy with how this is going. That's that book. Um, this was our circus that we did just to kind of, it was kind of like the culmination of the project that we had the, the circus. The residents had a ball with this. Uh, most of them were in it. And what I wanted to show you that we do, we do this every year. It's a yearbook of all the things that we did and we put it in our lobby. The families love this. Our, our uh, purchasing person is so good at it. Um, and so she just puts in all the different ones that we've had and we leave them out and people just can really get a flavor of all the neat different things that we do. And, and that, that hits them, I think, uh, really nicely. Then they see that it's, it's so much going on for the residents. Um, a lot of work with the iPad apps. I did a lot of research. The best one I found, and if anybody wants, has an iPod, iPad and wants to use it more, it would probably be easier to contact me and then I can kind of tell you what you're looking for because there's just so many different ones. But this is the best one. It's a laugh track free. And that way when you tell a joke and nobody laughs, you can go. I don't know if you can hear it. So it's just all different faces laughing, and you can do one at a time, but you can do them all. And then it kind of gets the residents laughing too, that laughter is contagious. Um, this is something you can order. We don't have this because we had all our own stuff, but if you wanted to just kind of get a kit going, you can get one real quick already made up. Um, one little note about the clown noses. We, um, 
we, were, we have those on our cart and we were having this great session, this lady's laughing and we're doing all the music and I went over and I put the clown nose on her, she was still smiling, I was kind of watching, I was trying to make sure, put the nose on her and she said, get that thing off of me! And I said, okay, well, all right, and this is like the one time, I wish I had it on video for today because it's like where you can see it, you think it's gonna be okay and then it's not, so we have to be careful with some of the things that people may not want. Everybody else wanted one. Um, these are some other places you can go and look that I didn't even realize that right in a Saratoga Springs, this big humor project has so much stuff on their website. Uh, but you can order these like smiles on sticks there, um, so many resources, so that's a good spot to go. And then this Association for Applied and Therapeutic Humor has a lot of stuff too. Um, we want to move towards, again, like I said, the more spontaneous moments of joy. Um, just, this is a book that we've used that really has a lot of just, uh, gets families in that philosophy, so I just stuck that up there. But I thought I would order these little smile trophies and then just kind of go around and give people a little reward when they're really using that um, to their advantage and to help the residents. Um, so our personal challenge is just it's the, the, the having to be more spontaneous, and that can be so hard in our setting. Um, we want to let go of our defensiveness. Um, it is, you know, we inevitably will have the staff person in the room who is thinking that you're, you know, being an idiot. And so you have to sort of get past that and watch what the residents are responding to because it's what they respond to that matters the most anyway. And then your own inhibitions of like, it's hard for some, for some staff to let go of that and to do that. So we can't really expect it of everyone. Um, we... There was the study that the Smile Project did, we had mentioned that earlier, that did show that when you do a lot more of these humor-based programs, that it can not only impact the residents, but also the staff, that the staff will boost their morale. We are a very high burnout uh, industry, so we need to, um, that's a great outcome of having some, some of these programs and getting the staff involved. The ones that are good at it, it's something they may gravitate towards. So, and we are hoping to just see a lot more of that as we kind of keep moving along, as you know, with any project. It's like there's always room to keep going and moving forward. Um, this was, <laughs> she is 103. She was born the Titanic, the day the Titanic sunk. I, I, just to see this come around the corner, how can you not find that funny? So those are the things you hope your staff, you know, can really appreciate these moments. They are so unique to the, to the dementia population. And if, if you can find the, the, the humor and the enjoyment in some of these things. Okay, so we're going to turn it back to Anne. Oh, yeah, you guys want to see? We, I'm going to show you uh, resident dancing. We, did our, we do dancing with the residents, which is like Dancing with the Stars. We have judges and we have um, the, the residents come up. Usually we try to get families involved so that it's a bigger family event, but they, they just love the whole getting dressed up. But here's a resident. Those of you who wouldn't dance at the beginning, she's putting you to shame. A good time, and so did everybody else watching her. So, uh, uh oh, Anne. Uh, wow, there's a lot open there. That's the one. That's it? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, we're going to go back to um, talking a little bit about. 
um, positive and negative humor related interactions because it sounds like from what Kelly said there was a lot of positive. But before we do, stand up for just a moment if you want to. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Hold it. Breathe out. Do it again. Good. Take your shoulders around. All right. Well, your buns. Oh, come on, people. You've got them. Shake them. All right, now sit down. I know, that was a lovely view for you, wasn't it, Kelly? <laughs> yeah. So, um, now how many of you were here for the first part of this? Okay, I just wanted to remind myself. So social interactions, um, I did my study from the frame of mind of social interactions as opposed to looking at like personalities in humor or personality characteristics. I was more interested in looking at how humor functioned within social interactions. And um, people seek social bonds for the intrinsic satisfactions they afford, such as shared leisure, humor, and other forms of pleasurable interaction. So that's part of the reason that people communicate, is they, they're looking for humor and things like that. This is also something that I think is really important to remember, and there's more research coming out about this, but social relationships, or the lack of social relationships, relationships constitute a major risk factor for health that is up there with cigarette smoking, blood pressure, blood lipids, obesity, and physical activity. So in other words, having positive social interactions are as important as making decisions not to smoke, to eat right, things like that, in terms of both physical, um, well, in terms of physical health. So it's really important to remember that doing this kind of thing is not just fluff. It really is important to ensuring that people remain healthy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about positive and negative social interactions, because this is kind of how I came up with what I decided to do. Positive interactions um, basically provide some kind of aid, things like reassurance, listening, uh, tangible aid or assistance. Negative interactions are interactions with family or friends that are harmful or hurtful, like criticisms, unwanted advice, demands, or misunderstandings. So I want you to think about, for a minute, the idea that, um, imagine for a minute that someone goes into an elder's suite or room to give some type of care. And um, the person goes in and they say, okay, I'm gonna, um, you know, let's change your depend. And the person goes along with it, the caregiver leaves and thinks, oh, okay, that was positive because I got the care done. But the person may be thinking, I hate this. I hate that experience, this is not fun for me. So what you may perceive or what one person may perceive as a positive interaction can be a negative interaction for another person. So it's really important to recognize that. Uh, positive social interactions, this is what research has shown. Positive interactions or social support helps to buffer the effects of stressors. So if you can have a positive interaction with somebody and then they go on to have a negative interaction with somebody else, you've actually helped them deal with that negative interaction by sort of um, pre-helping them, <laughs> put, put them in a good mood. Um, it helps older adults maintain a sense of meaning in life. The positive interactions help older adults to feel understood and appreciated. And how often do you think people with dementia feel understood and appreciated? Hopefully a lot, but probably not much, and certainly not enough. Um, bolster self-esteem, we all need that, um, and benefits physical health. And we talked a little bit about um, some of that stuff related to humor. Um, in the first session. Negative interactions create psychological stress. They're associated with low self-esteem. They contribute to dysfunctional attitudes and bad moods. They are detrimental to physical health. Um, when I was in graduate school, I worked on a study that literally showed that people who reported more negative social interactions had higher instances of chronic conditions. And there was some research to support that their mortality rates were higher. So literally, it's not important just to add positive interactions and social support. It's important to really focus on what are the things that might be leading people to appraise a situation as negative and how do we get rid of that? 
Um, there's also quite a bit of more recent research that indicates that pound for pound, negative social interactions are worse for you than positive interactions are good for you. So it's really important to try to eliminate um, or at least um, lessen the number of negative interactions that people experience. I just love that picture of Kelly's and so I put it in there for negative interactions. <laughs> so taking that idea of positive and negative social interactions, positive humor is the use of humor in an affiliative and inclusive way according to the person who's perceiving this. Negative humor is the use of humor in a destructive or inconsiderate way according to the person perceiving it. Um, I also grouped failed attempts at humor which I myself am very familiar with. Um, it's the, the instance when the perceiver doesn't get the meaning of the humor, feels left out, doesn't even realize there was a joke there, but realizes there was something and it wasn't funny or they missed it. Um, positive humor promotes bonding, signals inclusiveness, it builds trust, it helps people feel more hopeful, it's a means of face saving. Um, I remember reading a study about um, physicians and people with dementia, and when you think about a person with dementia who goes into a doctor's office and the doctor's giving them the mini manual state exam and the mocha and the slums and all those tests and you know the doctor's probably got their clinician's coat on and they're very serious and clinical about it, and the person with dementia is thinking, I don't know the answers to this, I probably should should, oh my gosh, shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Some people with dementia fight that. So the doctor will say something like, you know, do you remember this? And the person with dementia will say, heck no, why would I? You know, and use humor to change that power dynamic. Um, and that actually happens quite a bit with people who have dementia. I think it's a natural human defense mechanism to put yourself back up there in terms of the power dynamic. So that's really important. Um, humor also stimulates further interaction. Negative humor is a means of controlling others' behavior in not a nice way. It's a socially acceptable way to criticize or demean people. It in, um, reinforces unbalanced power structures, undermines people's power, um, and isolates people as outsiders. So like I told the last session, it's easy when you're in that mode of humor to sort of, you know, gently kind of cross that line into, you know, saying something that's not so nice about somebody. And I encourage you to really think about and pull back and don't do that. Don't let your humor become that. Um, because in that point, at that point, it stops being helpful and positive. It starts to be something else. So just a little bit about the study that I did. Um, I come from Oregon, and so um, in the Portland metro area, I went to 14 assisted living communities. These were randomly selected, but I'm not gonna go into all that stuff. I interviewed 140 residents. Um, I completed interviews for 140 residents. I probably interviewed about 190, and the interviews took between 60 minutes and three hours. So I got to spend a lot of time talking to people, and, um, and it was great. I really missed that when it was over. There, um, I use the MMSE because um, that's what everybody uses in research still. They're moving toward some other tests that are much better, um, like the slums or the MOCA, but um, you know, if you wanna publish this stuff, you have to use what everybody else has used for years. Um, and I didn't pay for it. <laughs> so there, because it was research. Um, so there are many mental state um, uh, scores were between 15 and 30 with an average of about 25. So these were people who on average had some um, cognitive impairment, um, but, but pretty, pretty mild. Um, um, I don't need to talk about the rest of that stuff. So the results of this, basically I created a scale um, that asked people questions about um, different things that happened to them. Um, and in your handout packet, you'll find um, the list of um, the questions that I, um, oops, I'll come back to her. Um, the list of questions, and you could actually take that um, scale if you wanted to, you could, you could fill it out. But um, it has questions to do with, you know, how often do people tell a joke or funny story that cheers you up on the positive side to things on the negative side, like how often do people say something about someone um, behind his or her back when she's not there? Um, and it was very telling the kinds of things that people do. Um, and what was interesting about this was the positive humor didn't really um, 
wasn't really correlated with a lot of other stuff, but the negative humor was quite correlated. Um, in keeping with those research findings that the negative stuff really stands out to people and has a greater impact than the positive stuff. That may be because the negative stuff doesn't happen as often, so when it does, it really stands out. But regardless, negative humor, people who reported more negative humor-related interactions um, had greater depressive affect. In other words, they had a depressive mood. People who reported more negative humor-related interactions had um, just worse moods in general. They had greater social and emotional loneliness. Um, the only thing that was statistically significant about positive humor was that it was associated with more positive mood. So it was really interesting that it was the negative stuff that really um, showed up. So what all this means is negative humor-related interactions may be more detrimental to mental health than positive humor-related interactions are helpful. Um, but research indicates there are physical and emotional benefits of laughter and that relationships can benefit from that positive social humor. So I don't want you to think because in my study, positive humor didn't do a lot that it isn't worthwhile. Because mine, mine was one study and it was a small sample. So focus on the positive, but also focus on eliminating the negative and really looking at the reactions of the elders you're working with and seeing, you know, is this person... Um, thank you for the 10 minute mark, Karen. Um, is this person seeming to really uh, enjoy this or is this person just waiting to get through this? Like I see some of your faces, your stomachs are going. Um, so bottom line, accentuate the positive, but maybe more importantly, eliminate the negative. <laughs> and she's there to just add an exclamation point to what I just said. <laughs> Um, so, I want to show you some, um, these so are some vignettes. You just had your breakfast. Pause this for just mm -hmm. a second. And now it's time you. for you to brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I went to a community um, called Terwilliger Plaza in Oregon, and it's assisted living, or this is assisted living, and we filmed some vignettes. Um, so, what you'll see is a neutral vignette where there's no humor used. Then you'll see... Uh, positive humor used, and then you'll see negative humor used. And it just gives you an idea in more of a community setting um, what kinds of things you might want to look for. So this is the neutral one. So you just had your breakfast, mm -hmm. and now it's time for you to brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do it. Just brush, put in your mouth. Yeah. Open it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to move on to the Check. positive. We had a long day. It's time to say good night, Gracie. Oh, good night. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Time for you to brush your teeth and go to bed. Okay. Tomorrow we have more. Oh. So one of the things that went along with this um, when we used it for training was a little profile and one of the things that Chuck used to like was, good night Gracie. So she used that phrase. Chuck, now here's the, the failed humor. Of the day. It's time for you to brush your teeth. High five. That Do doesn't like make sense this. to Chuck. You see? Yeah. Do, Do like this. Do, yeah, go. Let's see, Chuck. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, I like this. Yeah. Woo, isn't that nice? We can dance. So you can see, and, and it's, you know, I, we tried to make them somewhat subtle, um, but you can see how when she's using the positive humor, she's using something that she knows he likes to, um, as a part of the care routine. And when it's the, the failed humor, the negative humor, she's getting in his face and she's using things like a high five or we can dance. And he's just like, I don't know, this doesn't make any sense to me. 
So here's another one. How do you think we'll have to eat tonight? Well, I hope it's... Good evening. Well, Hello. What are we having tonight? We have either tilapia fish or chicken on the menu for dinner. Do you like either one? Well, I would, I would have the fish. You, have, you would like the fish and both come with either soup or salad. And uh, the, the choice of soup again? The soups are Hungarian mushroom or clam chowder, and I remember you don't like clam chowder, so would you like the Hungarian mushroom? I think so. All right. And I will have the tilapia. Tilapia and soup or salad. And I'll have chowder. The clam chowder. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I will get this order put in. Thank you. Thank you. This one's not quite as subtle. <laughs> well, what can we expect tonight? Same old thing. Bonjour and oh, welcome wow. to Tervillager. I will be your waitress for the evening. My name is Amy, or you can call me Ame. Hee hee Dorothy, this, the choices are tilapia, fish, or chicken. What do you do to the chicken? <laughs> what do I do to it? I dance with it slowly. Slow dancing. I'll have the tango. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how to tango. <laughs> well, work on it. All right, so you, do you still want the chicken? It's yeah. smothered in a barbecue sauce. Smothered? I like that. All right, well, extra smothered. I've never had a smothered chicken before. <laughs> Two chickens then on the menu. Are you both ordering chicken? Are you ordering so, chicken? Yes. Mother. Would you yes. like soup or salad with your chicken? The soup choice is? Hungarian mushroom or clam chowder, and I believe you don't like you the like clam chowder. Hung Hungarian? <laughs> well, Hungarian is better than the chowder. <laughs> <laughs> It was all ad lib. Those residents just ad libbed well, everything. What do you think we'll have tonight? This is the failed humor. That tough old hamburger. Hey, hey, but hey! Good evening. How are you guys doing? We have fish or chicken on the menu tonight. We're doing very well, thank you. Well, maybe not after you eat this food. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like the fish or the chicken? What do you do to the chicken? Uh, it's smothered in a red sauce. I'm not quite sure what it is. Ooh. Can't really tell in the kitchen here, can you? <laughs> what else do I get to choose? Oh, uh, probably some salad. Hopefully it's not wilted. Well, what do we have? Hi. Fish or chicken? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'll have the old chicken. Well, hopefully it's not old. <laughs> so you can see, um, you know, how different kinds of humor don't seem to work. It's kind of funny because when it does work, it makes you laugh less, but when it doesn't work, then you laugh more, which is, <laughs> it's, it's like almost an uncomfortable, oh my gosh, look at that. This is a wake-up routine. Good morning, Betty. Mm -hmm. Kimberly. Mm -hmm. Did you sleep okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, it is 7 o'clock, and your daughter's going to pick you up at 7.30. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of mm -hmm. running a tight schedule, okay. which I know you don't seem to like when, I, when we get together. So I'm going to go out and get you some coffee. Mm. And I'll come back, and we're going to have to kind of move a little quick this morning, because your daughter doesn't like waiting. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay, I'll be back in a few minutes. Good morning, Betty. Betty likes Kimberly. Elvis, just so you know. That's part of her profile. Oh, I feel like singing this morning. Really? It had to be you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It Sorry, had doesn't to like be Elvis. You. Can you get up? Do you think you can wake yeah. up? If I stop singing? Oh, maybe. <laughs> okay. I'll stop singing then. Okay, so uh, you want to think about getting up, okay? All right. 
She doesn't like Elvis. Sorry, I got that wrong. That's important for this piece. Hi. How are you? Oh. Oh my gosh. Did you sleep okay? Oh my gosh. I have a song for you. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I went and saw Elvis mm -hmm. Presley movie last mm -hmm. night. Yeah. Viva. I don't want a song. Yeah, it's all about Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. Don't you want to get up? No, go Oh, away. why not? Why don't you want to get up and sing with me? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. This is going to be a great day. In, in your uh, packet, the last thing in your packet is a little thing that says, my plan. Um, and again, if you don't have a packet, you can um, send me an email. You could even send it to me tonight, and I could send it to you. Um, I want you to take some time, and it can be over lunch, whenever you want to do it, and just think about what we've talked about um, today, and make yourself a little plan. It can be a little tiny baby step, or it can be something that's a bigger thing. But take something from this that was meaningful to you, hopefully there was something, <laughs> and um, make a little plan so that you can go back to your place of work and infuse some humor or do something that's going to help you um, to make a change that you want. And that's what the plan is for. Um, so this is just a little uh, add joy to life. Some resources, all of these are in your packet, or your uh, packet from online. And always look on the bright side of life. And we'll see if my clicker, my clicker is not clicking anymore. No. Oh, the computer's not clicking either. Okay. So we've got a couple minutes if you, well, we don't really have a couple minutes, but if you want to ask us questions, we'll be hanging out here for a little while. So give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming. Our email addresses are there. Please keep in touch with us. Karen, do you want them? Thank mm -hmm. you.